Okay, Code for Earth. Uh, what is Code for Earth? Have you heard about it? I don't know. I will explain a little bit what it is, and I think uh, there are many options for you to participate. <clears throat> and this presentation has been, uh, came to life with the support of my dear colleague Esperanza Cuatero and then Gian Zain, who is here in the room again, one of my famous colleagues from ECMWF. Good. So Code for Earth is supported and uh, con we have contribution by all the organizations, uh, as you see the logos. Um, so I go who I am. Most of you, or many of you, have probably seen the keynote uh, on Wednesday, so I will not repeat. Ah, my other colleagues are also here. <laughs> hey. So I'm, I've been working in the GIS uh, community for many, many years um, in various companies in, in Germany and Bonn. Uh, I'm half German, half Greek. You might wonder about the name. And uh, then I've been over 15 years with uh, OTC. Uh, like two years ago, I decided to take a sub couple of months of sabbatical, and since one and a half years, I'm working now with the ECMWF, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Um, I'm a supporter of free and open source software, open standards, and open data. And um, I've been, or I'm a charter member of OSGU since 2008, and have been around pretty long in the community. So what is the European Center for Medium, weather, medium Range Weather Forecasts? Who knows the ECMWF? Well, nice. So you, probably you learned something on, on Wednesday, that's, that's cool. So we are um, a member organization that has been established uh, nearly 50 years ago. We oper have a 24-7 operational service where we do numerical weather predictions and we are supporting our member states and cooperating states as well as um, businesses. We are also a research organization um, where we experiment to continuously improve our models. <clears throat> and we do reef forecasts and climate reanalysis and additionally we operate two EU Copernicus services. That's the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service and the Copernicus Climate Change Service. And we support the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. Um, and yeah, additionally, and it had, has been mentioned before, um, we are also involved in Destination Earth. Um, I would like to have a short shout out because in the context of Copernicus, we also have two new pilot initiatives. That's the Health Hub and the Energy Hub. And um, we are looking into Copernicus. The Health Hub is about environmental data and earth observation data at the services of the general public health. And the Energy Hub is about um, and connecting environmental data and earth observation um, to the green economy or green energy uh, transition. And if you have experiences uh, with that and if you have projects that relate Copernicus data um, to, the, to health or energy, uh, please feel free to contact us, either directly my colleague um, Julie Letertre or you can of course, talk to, talk to me or to my colleagues as well. Good, but we are here to hear about Code for Earth. And um, who, who of you have, he have heard about Code for Earth before? Okay, good. Um, so, what is, so this is the, uh, I will talk about what is Code for Earth, how does it, does it work, how you can get involved, and then I will showcase a few examples um, what the project has been doing. So Code for Earth is a key, inno a key innovation action run by the uh, ECMWF and has been supported by Copernicus, Destination Earth, the Helmholtz Zentrum Helion in Gestach, close to Hamburg, and uh, IFAP, um, an Italian-based foundation which is dealing a lot with machine learning. So we want to enhance the visibility of what we do 
Um, and what also what our partners do, and in the context of ECMWF, it's of course also, you know, we want to promote um, the access of our data. Um, just think about a small research program or kind of a hackathon, um, an, an extended hackathon, a small research program. Um, we work with external talents, we call them young talents, that work over, over a couple of months with mentors and experts. And uh, here again it's, again, it's about working together, getting an understanding of um, what can be done and solving mostly real world uh, um, challenges, real world scenarios, and also make an impact in earth sciences, computer science, and applied data science, and of course, open source software development. Um, the, project, the projects that um, successfully end or, or um, uh, finish their programming, uh, the programming phase, um, complete the project, they receive a 5,000 euro stipend. <coughs> the program has been around since 2018 and was called before ESOC, like ECMWF, Summer of Weather Code. So you might also, it was related a little bit also to Google of Summer Code. So looking into detail, as I said, um, I know, I know. <laughs> sorry. Um, as I said, we have uh, <laughs> since 2018, um, we have been running since 2018, we have been working or we have supported nearly 60 projects um, and that have been mentored by 107 mentors and we have uh, uh, an equally high number of participants. So this is the timeline more or less and I will go in the various phases. So we usually start now, and this goes until, let's say, mid of January, I walk around uh, and talk with my colleagues and ask them if they have uh, any ideas or any, any problem statements, any challenges, things they always wanted to do uh, but never had the time that can be dealt with in about four months. Um, and we call them challenges. So I identify challenges. And meanwhile, we are working also with external partner networks. So um, as I mentioned, especially, um, and you will see this in more detail. So this is, we look for challenges with an inno uh, innovative um, character, and then um, once I have collected all these challenges, um, I go, we, we go in the next phase, but uh, as I mentioned, this year we have worked with, um, or this edition we have worked with uh, partners, and uh, so we have been working, we identified ch joint challenges with the Euro European Environment Agency, with uh, CSOC and the University of Bonn, University of Reading, and uh, as mentioned also before, Herion, um, Helmholtz Zentrum Herion in uh, Germany. So once the, uh, the challenges have been collected, um, my colleague Esperanza and I, we are preparing um, a call for participation. That means all the challenges go on GitHub and I will show you uh, later how, where you can find the information. And we issue the call for par participation, usually beginning of um, March. And um, we offer two uh, Q&A webinars where interested people can ask questions, we explain how it works. And um, people can browse through the GitHub repositories, get in contact also with the mentors, and um, see if they have a solution for a challenge. <clears throat> um, after the call for participation ends, we have a selection phase. This is when the mentors or the submitters of, a, of, of, of the challenges, they review the proposals for their challenge, and then we select um, per challenge uh, um, one proposal. So who can participate in the call for participation? Well, the program is open to everyone who is uh, interested. That can be an indiv individual. We usually have teams of, um, that, that um, submit a proposal, and they come from various backgrounds. That could be you know, earth sciences, computer sciences, and software development. It's really, it's really broadly the, uh, the, the horizon of the project is quite big. 
Um, then it's open for students at all levels. If you are a startup and want to work with ECM and WF data, you can um, check if this is of interest for you. Um, but we had also have, uh, you know, um, bigger companies, they, they wanted to get in touch with ECM WF and, and, and work with that. So literally everyone can submit a proposal. Um, once we have selected the teams, the coding phase starts, and that's usually in May. So this is the time when it's about innovation, collaboration, and the development of open source software. Uh, we have a four-month coding phase that goes from May through August. And we had a fantastic uh, um, kickoff meeting this year with many, with all the projects, the mentors, and the participants. And um, what I would like to point to oh, is the yep, midterm webinars. But I have another slide. It's not so easy. <laughs> um, good. So the coding phase in 2024 started with 13 projects. And we covered 12 challenges. We have 52 participants, and um, they are mentored by 40 mentors, which is a huge group to handle. Um, but it's really, we are really exciting because excited because it's it's nice to see how the teams are working. So once uh, the coding phase is finished, uh, we and if the successfully finished projects, uh, we invite them to a final Code for Earth Day that will happen uh, in person for the invited people in Reading, and for the general public, the team, uh, the, the event uh, is uh, online available, so you can follow the, um, the presentations of the results. <coughs> so these are the projects of the 24 edition, and uh, before I go into, uh, in, uh, uh, to GitHub and our, our website, Please go on our website because there you can register for the midterm webinars. They will take place on 17th and 25th, uh, 5th of July, so that's in two weeks. One and a half hours, the team will present. The teams will present what they have done so far. Um, but let's look a little bit into the uh, project. So, yeah. So this is the Code for Earth website, and. Here again, if you, if you uh, go on the website, you will find immediately um, the uh, registration page. And you can have, again, uh, you know, an explanation. You can read how it works. And what is interesting as well, you know, if you can go to the archive site. No, nope, sorry. To the archive site. And you find all all the projects from previous editions. So if you, if you would like to see what, what, have, what the projects have been doing, it's, um, you know, last year we had, for example, fire forecasting. Um, this links you to a YouTube presentation uh, that is from the final day. And um, you have a project description. If you click here, the project is described. Surprise, surprise. And um, you can find also all the information um, on GitHub. So we have a ECMWF Code for Earth GitHub repository, and there you can browse all the challenges of previous years. And um, let's look at the, um, at the 24 edition. You know, you have here the project descriptions, what the projects have been doing, and um, For example, the Tales of Dry Land. Um, here you have the description. This is how, uh, do you remember I, I talked about the call for participation? This is what, um, what people can read. You know, it's a description of the goal, mentors and skill, the challenge description. And um, during the call for participation, people or interested people can ask questions here. Uh, and you see there there is communication taking place. and. Um, so, if I go back, so that is, you can find all these descriptions for 2024 and also going back um, on our website, uh, like this is interesting as well, that's a regional to urban air quality mapper. Um, 
and, and they are looking into downscaling regional pollutant data to urban levels, visualizing accurate air quality insights. Um, but it's not only the, descri the description that you can find uh, on, on, on GitHub, but also the uh, repositories of those projects that actually developed software and actually did something. Um, and again, you know, just uh, let's take uh, again the tales of drought. <clears throat> so they, they um, will craft uh, from Python notebooks um, or they offer a way to understand climate data um, concerning droughts. And if you go here, you know, you have all the information. As I said, this is a project from, from, from this year, so it's quite, uh, it's in progress and uh, so under, constru under construction, but they have a nice description, um, what they want to do, a roadmap, and Everything you find on GitHub is mainly is, is managed by the, by the teams themselves, so we, we have uh, not a lot of uh, restrictions, what they need to put up. Some projects decide that during the coding phase, they work in private, so they are not, um, the repositories um, are not um, open to the public, as you could have seen uh, here. But if you go back, for example, um, to the repositories and so that is the fire forecast one that is from um, from last year it was about fire forecasting well, <laughs> name is program um, and you have the entire documentation of the project here um, and you can also access the teams, you know, and that is the idea of the program. So if I go back to my presentation. Um, yeah, so these are the, the, are the 13 projects of this year, and uh, I, I did not go into detail because we have also a lot of machine learning stuff. Um, yeah, may, maybe just... Mm. I need different glass. <laughs> um, the, the projects of this year, you know, we have here the CAMS um, visualizer with CAMS data, and then we talked about the tales of dry land. Um, then again, CAMS, it's uh, the Copernicus Atmospheric um, Monitoring Service, then air quality monitoring, sun visor is nice, they're looking into which which uh, urban areas are, are good or, or for um, photovoltaic um, parts, so it looks into the green energy aspects. Um, they're looking, that's uh, an, a project from there with, with AI. So it's really, really the, the topics of the challenges and the projects are really huge. And um, yeah, I would like to invite you to have a look at the, at the projects and also um, look into or, or join us for the midterm webinars and get a get an idea what Code for Earth is because um, as, as I mentioned before it's you know it's a yearly program so I'm starting uh, end of the year again uh, collecting ideas collecting challenges and uh, early March 2025 or in uh, 24 uh, or in f end of February we will um, issue the next call for participation. Good. And then, I have shared that uh, with you before. And yeah, I like those closing thoughts. Coming together is a beginning. That's already nice. Staying together is progress. And I, I see a lot of people here in the community, um, you know, they come not only once to a fast 4 g so, but more often. And what I really like is working together. That is success, and I think uh, we have so many challenges ahead of us. So let's work together um, and be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Actina. Are there any questions? Thank you. How can we get uh, one of these bags, the code for her? <laughs> <laughs> you have to talk to me.
<laughs> no, the, the, there was another question. So, um, are there in any of these uh, prototypes that you developed during the, this, the, the hackathon? I cannot finish because, sorry, it's very hard to understand. Okay, is it better? Yes. Okay. Any, do any of these uh, prototypes that are, these codes, of the projects that are developed during the, the event, are later adopted through, uh, incorporated in ECMWF in a way? So do you pick up these software projects and, and take them to production sometimes? Yeah, so the question was, what happens if the projects end with the results? We have projects that just stay as they are. That's fine, that's, uh, nothing happens. But then we have projects that really go into, they're taken into operational services uh, of ECMWF and are further, further developed. So for example, last year we had a um, regional reanalysis project with machine learning um, that was really, uh, we had actually two projects they, and they were not competing. It's not a competition. So each project that f finished gets a 5,000 euro stipend. So last year, this reanalysis reanal re projects um, mm. I know that the colleagues picked it up and, uh, and they're building on that, they're working on that, they're developing it further and another project um, was very successful and, and, and picked up by, by the team. It really depends uh, on the results of the project. I have a question, if I may. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, how uh, do you pick mentors? Are they part of the team when they present the proposal? Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, I started last year, and how I picked mentors was the following. I went a uh, cup of coffee to each office and, and, and introduced myself and said, I'm running uh, now Code for Earth. By the way, do you have a challenge? <laughs> so, and uh, I, I'm... Mainly the colleagues come to us and say, hey, or, well, of course, we inform them that we are looking for challenges, and then c colleagues come to us and say, hey, Atina, Esperanza, we have, we have an idea. So it's mainly driven, well, we ask them, and they come back to us. So and the mentors are, are the, uh, the people that propose the challenge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so what we do now with external partners, like uh, the project we have or with the University of Reading or the Helm Helmholtz Centrum here on, um, or EEA, we approach them or I talk with colleagues that, hey, you're working together with EEA. Is there an idea uh, or a topic that would be fit for a, a, a joint challenge for Code for Earth? And uh, then I talk to colleagues at EEA and uh, colleagues at ECMWF and, you know, uh, invite them to think about a challenge and then in, in usually they come together, they have ideas. What is important, if someone is interested to submit a challenge, um, we need always to find a partner uh, in ECMWF because it should be in the interest of the partner organization as well as for ECMWF, so that is a benefit for, yeah. for both. And from then on, these submitters, they become uh, mentors. So, good, then I go back. So, 15th, uh, 17th and 25th of July, I want to invite you again. Join us for the midterm webinars, and thanks for your attention. Thank you, let's give a big applause to Athena. Thank you everyone for staying calm and no red or yellow cards we're giving.